the fine tuning argument, it's such a bad argument for God because it, it, it looks like you're saying God had to fine tune this number to one part in 120 so that his beautiful creation could exist. But my point is, God could have made it zero, which is the sensible value, and we can exist and everything can be better. So God's a pretty crummy arch- architect if, if he chose this ridiculous value mm-hmm. when it, when zero would have made everyone happier and we would all be living longer and and there'd be a lot more life in the universe. So the argument that that that, that ridiculous value points to an intelligent designer is ridiculous. It points to a pretty unintelligent designer. Hello, this is Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast number 199. And it is quite crazy to me that we're almost at 200. But this episode is with Lawrence Krauss, a theoretical physicist who has taught at Yale, Arizona State University, and Case Western, and is the founder of ASU's Origins Project. He's a best-selling author, and if you're an avid podcast listener, you're probably already aware that he hosts the Origins podcast as well. We have a pretty wide-ranging discussion about the current state of physics, whether or not it's in a crisis, the potential shortcomings of string theory, whether the world is a hologram, the existence of God, the role of science in ethics, and then some of his late and amazing great friends like Cormac McCarthy and Christopher Hitchens. And Lawrence's most recent book is The Edge of Knowledge, a link to which you will find in the description. One correction that I need to make is at one point in the conversation, I say that there is a duality in M theory, which, well, where the string length in one theory is inversely proportional to the string length in another theory. And this isn't technically incorrect, but to be more precise, there's a duality in M theory, among many others, like S duality and the ADS CFT correspondence, which I've spoken about with Juan Maldacena. But this one is called T duality, in which the radius of the microscopic curled up dimensions in one string theory is inversely proportional to that of another. So the connection between the two theories is more explicitly about the size of these microscopic dimensions rather than the string lengths, which opens up very interesting philosophical questions about the relativity of space-time between theories, and then also, I mean, more excitingly, whether or not space-time is physically fundamental, though that is a topic for another time. I just wanted to clarify what I was saying. But now, reviews, comments, likes, subscriptions, These things are all extraordinarily important. If you have not rated the show on Apple or Spotify, it only takes 10 seconds, 8 seconds, 7 seconds or so to do that, and that would be wonderful. There's also a Patreon if you would like a link to an ad-free RSS feed and then show notes. But now, without any further ado... I hope that you enjoyed this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with Lawrence. So I recently spoke with your friend, uh, fellow podcaster, Brian Keating, who, oh. who within the field of physics kind of occupies something like the flip coin of your position as a theoretical cosmologist. And he he described his attraction to ex- being an experimentalist as kind of oriented around this idea of being an exterminator of faulty theories. And I just thought I would start by asking about what it was that attracted you to being the guy that generates these theories. Well, uh, it seems sexier. Um, <laughs> it, it you know if, if it. People, although I look, let me be clear. I have great respect for experimentalists, and that respect has only grown the older I've gotten. But 
you know, when you're young, you read about Newton and Galileo and 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 Einstein. Now it turns out Newton did experiments and so did Galileo, but but um, you you think of the and Maxwell and although although Faraday it, 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 it's a big hero of mine, but you know, so you think of the people who are sort of trying to understand nature at its very basic scale, and it's often theory. But it's also that I, I just, I think, um, well, there's a combination of things. So I, I liked, I mean, I like mathematics, and I did a degree in mathematics as well as physics, the two degrees, and that, I think, played a role. Expe- when you're younger, the experiments you do in physics labs are never interesting, <laughs> and and I grew to hate them. But in fact, one of the reasons I did a, a, two, a double major, two degrees, was to avoid a physics lab. Um hmm. But uh, but also I worked uh, for two or three years. During much of the time I was an undergraduate, I worked in a lab, a summer job. And uh, and I remember working for five months to fix a kind of a something called a it, it, well, it's like a cloud chamber. It's, it's something to look at elementary particles and accelerator and 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 designing something and making the electrodes just right and and then. And eventually got to work, but after four or five months, and I just thought, wow, do I really want to spend five months tuning this little thing? To... But of course, you know, that's what's necessary to discover the new laws of nature. And as I say, later on, I, I kind of began to appreciate it a lot more. And I've become, I've been a part of several experimental collaborations. Um, but I think theory just was pure. And I think it was just a matter of, of, uh, of, of thinking of who, of sort of who the famous physicists were that were my kind of idols, time Feynman, you know, uh, people like you know, and, they, and and Einstein and Dirac, and it, you know, coming up with new ideas that describe nature just seemed remarkable, and also awe, awe-inspiring in the sense that uh, having been in that position, when you're now, I don't want to make it seem like physics is done by people alone in a dark room at night because it isn't. Although people get that sense. From Einstein, it's a cooperative activity, but the idea of if you're sitting at your desk and you're at the, the thought that somehow nature might actually adopt what you're talking about, or, or they, it, it's 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 almost terrifying. It's really kind of interesting. It's a mm-hmm. weird feeling. The one or two times in my life where I've thought, I, I, and one or two times I've been right there, where I thought I really understood something about nature that that was unusual and hadn't been understood before. Um, it, it is, uh, it's a weird feeling. I'm definitely inclined to agree with you that the theory feels much sexier. And I was just, I was surprised when I was reading his book about losing the Nobel prize that so many more or far more Nobel prizes go, it seems to experimentalists than to theoretical. That's as it should be. Look, oh, I mean, so? I say that as someone who proposed something that was I know I... <laughs> validated and experimentalist, of course, won the Nobel Prize. But because science is an experimental discipline, it's mm. an empirical discipline. It's not like math. It is mm-hmm. the, the heart and soul of science is experiment. That's what determines what's true or not. Not theorists, not an elegant theory or a beautiful equation. It's whether nature adopts something. So it's perfectly appropriate that mm. most of the Nobel Prizes in I mean, they're arbitrary anyway, but most of the Nobel Prizes go to experimentalists because that's the, you know, and when when we proposed dark energy as a explaining the way the universe looked while it was true, um, no one, I don't, I think it's fair to say very few people believed us until the experiments validated it. The experiments convinced the world. So, hmm. I mean, you know, it would be nice to, to, to get the Nobel Prize for that, but it's much, actually, I, I adopt the word terminology of Feynman, which I think I really mean, and I think he really meant. For me, the great thrill was being right, was actually knowing, you know, anticipating. And that's better than, I mean, I, anyway, the prizes are nice, but it's it's uh, it's a real, to, you don't often in your career get that opportunity to have, to, to really recognize something and understand nature in a way that hasn't been understood before. Uh-huh. Well, something you said that, you said just now that really jumped out at me is that physics isn't about equations or or theories so much as it's about experiment. And this brings me to to your book, Hiding 
in the mirror. And oh, that part, this is okay. the last name I'm going to drop, but this conversation is going to air right after one with Stephen Wolfram, in which we spoke oh. all about his search for a fundamental theory of physics. So since on the Origins podcast, you've had so many conversations with physicists on adjacent topics, I thought I ought to start uh, broadly with whether or not you, you think there's a crisis in physics right now. And I suspect that string theory might uh, come into this somewhere. I don't think there's a crisis in physics. There are different areas of physics that are that are having hard times, but physics itself is quite vibrant. There's new technologies being developed, in properties of materials, bio, biophysics, uh, you know, quantum systems. Uh, there's tremendous developments taking place, and they're exciting, a, a, a lot of them. Uh, particle physics is in the doldrums, I would say, and has been, I mean, for lack of, coming back to what I said before, for, la for lack of experimental evidence of things, the standard model, which is the mo a, a book I wrote after the, the one you're talking about, but the, the book I wrote called The Greatest Story Ever Told So Far, is about the greatest story ever told so far. I think the greatest intellectual achievement of humankind is the standard model of particle physics, which explains three of the four forces of nature perfectly. And it came about in a sort of 10 to 15 year period. And it's remarkable. But since that standard model, there are lots of loose hole ends. And, uh, and um, there there's been no evidence that's really pointed us in the direction that we should be going. We built accelerators. The discovery of the Higgs was, was profoundly important. I didn't believe the Higgs was actually there. I thought there'd be some nature would find some nicer mechanism to do what it did, but it didn't. I was wrong. Um, but other than the, these particles having neutrinos having mass, there's really been no experimental data of any significance that's affected our understanding of the fundamental structure of matter and the forces of nature. String theory has gone on and done lots of mathematics, and it's been very helpful in various areas of physics using that mathematics, but it, certainly the central premise of string theory has no evidence, has, has, there's no evidence to support it. That, you know, uh, hiding in the mirror, I talked about why one might be led to string theory and why it's, it's well motivated, but it hasn't really had a great success in what it originally intended to do, not a single one. Um, it's just become more and more complicated. That doesn't mean it's wrong, but it, it, there's no evidence of it. And so particle physics it, it per se is is having a, a trouble. And I think that's one of the reasons many people have moved to the area that I was one of the people who sort of started in the early 1980s, the area of particle astrophysics. Because I realized at the time, even in the 19, early 1980s, that Nature, the universe, of course, was a particle physics experiment. It was performed, and now it was data analysis, and um, and that one could look at the universe for 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 evidence of things that you couldn't possibly test at accelerators. So, if you want to, um, you could use the uni universe as a laboratory to test fundamental physics. And I started doing that in the early '80s, and um, and now it's an industry because, uh, sure, look at the big dark energy, dark matter. These things are. These things are coming out of astrophysics and cosmology and not so much out of particle accelerators. I um, mean, you know, there's still intriguing things that are happening, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. There's things that where there are anomalies that may or may not point at some new physics. But it's been 40 years, and there really hasn't been any anything significant. And I think that's that's hard times. Uh, you know, the Large Hadron Collider is gonna, has increased its luminosity and energy, and maybe it'll discover... The particles that make up dark matter and supersymmetry, but there's been no evidence of it. And a lot of the, we all thought that if if those things were around, supersymmetry, that would be probably be the first thing that large hadron collider would see, and not not the Higgs. And so anyway, that, so that's a, that's an area of physics that is problematic and has been and and it, and has sort of been mired in too much theory and not enough experiment. And whenever that happens, I think uh, theories uh, physics has problems. But it's only one area of physics, and physics encompasses so many things. So I don't think physics is a crisis at all. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm. I'm very glad that you disambiguated physics and in general and pointed out that there are so yeah. many different subfields. But maybe before we come back to particle physics, which is as you say is in the doldrums, 
Uh, I'd like to, I guess, clarify something that's closer to home for you. So are you saying that cosmology is, or, or particle astrophysics is just sort of humming along in this normal science period within a paradigm or uh, it's not like in need of, of a revolution or anything right now. Well, it sounds a little too philosophical for me, that whole question. Yeah. Look, there's new, anytime you open a new window on the universe, it, you're surprised and it's exciting. And there are lots of new windows in the universe open up with James Webb Space Telescope and new other and planet finding missions too. But, um, and you know, and dark energy, I don't think there's anything interesting that's happened with dark energy since, we first proposed it and it was first observed, um, at which I said at the time, I said, it's not going to be the, 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 it, everything I could think about it theoretically would suggest that there wouldn't be any evidence that would tell you exactly what it was. And that's been valid. I even made a bet with uh, Stephen Hawking and, and a Nobel Prize winning friend of mine, Frank Wilczek, although Frank has refused to acknowledge that we made the bet where, you know, they both said we'd understand dark energy in 10 years. And, and I said, well, anyway, that was years ago. But, um, uh, so I, I think, um, there, there's lots of exciting, uh, observations going on with new machines and new uh, telescopes and new satellites. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's spinning on, not as if, I mean, as I say, the standard model of cosmology in some sense, I'm worried I even have written about this, might become like the standard model of particle physics because while there are always little nuggets that suggest there may be some tweak here or there, usually they're found to be wrong. A recent example is a claim to see galaxies far too early, and then it was discovered they weren't as early as people thought. And so the standard model of cosmology with this weird dark energy, which we don't understand, and weird dark matter, which we have a better idea of thinking about possibilities for it, but we have no evidence for it directly has withstood the test of time and it's some it's this model where we don't understand the basics but appears to describe the universe and and I'm, I'm i am worried that that if continue if future observations just continue to validate this picture without any evidence that points us in a new direction of, of fundamental understanding that it could become problematic too hmm. do you have any hunches at the moment about dark energy or dark matter sure <laughs> any in particular that you give really high credence to look a hunch is a hunch as a scientist i know that it's that's a, what all it is it's a speculation uh, uh, look particle dark matter the likelihood that dark matter is a new type of elementary particle is overwhelming i think mm. and um, and, you know, the standard candidates are very good candidates. Supersymmetry and, and particles called axions are the best, the only real kosher candidates that I would say, because they were developed to explain problems in particle physics, have nothing to do, having nothing to do with dark matter. I mean, you know, young people or other people like to invent dark matter particles to kind of fit the data, but that's, that's garbage because it, they're not motivated from a fundamental perspective. But mm. both supersymmetry and and axions, which address the strong CP problem, a fundamental problem of symmetries in particle theory, were all proposed having nothing to do with dark matter. And then it was discovered they could be perfect candidates. So I have to say those are my two. To maintain my, they're, they're, they're still my favorite candidates. Supersymmetry has gone down in my hunch in the betting pool because of Large Hadron Collider. And I regularly think of new experiments. I thought, oh, look, the experiments that are being used to look for dark matter are experiments that I proposed 40 years ago, in part. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and I've thought a lot of ways about trying to detect axions. It's fascinating for me. So I, I, I continue to think about those things. It's great to propose the experiments because then the experiment just spent 40 years building them, but you can just write the paper and you can go on and do something else. But um, um, dark energy, I have no... Uh, look, I have no idea. I mean, anyone who tells you they have an idea about dark energy is lying. Um, I mean, they have an idea, but it's not worth talking about. We really have no fundamental. It's the it's the most bizarre thing in physics. There's no. It's inexplicable in a in a in a fundamental way. Now, I proposed models for it and why you might understand why it's so small. And but I'd be amazed if any of them were right. Hmm. 
Uh, but before we move on, though, I'd like to get back to that dark matter very briefly. But how was it that you proposed uh, testing axions? Granted that. Uh, well, look, uh, I mean, the dark matter, the the, the, the the WIMP detectors are one that had more involved in the early stages where we proposed detectors that could detect very small energy deposits and big detectors underground, and those are being built. When it comes to axions, that fundamental idea of using axions change electromagnetism a little bit. Mm. And the original idea of, of, of converting cosmic axions into electromagnetic signals was really due to a guy named Pierre Sakivi. We looked at ways to make it practical um, with my friend Frank Wilczek, who had proposed the name axions, by the way, when he first proposed axions. But um, And so I've thought about ways to actually implement this idea that axions affect electromagnetism in a variety of ways. We did the I think we did the first realistic calculations of what the rates of of of, of, of detector production of axion induced signals would be for experimentalists who then built experiments based on that. And those experiments keep getting refined. And I've exposed I've proposed different kinds of experiments. Now I've been look, looking at lasers as, as a and I wrote a paper a few years ago on that, and it may or may not become useful. So I keep trying. It's a joy for me over the last 40 years to periodically learn enough about experiments to be able to propose, or learn enough about technology to be able to propose new new possible experiments. And so we'll, you know, we'll see. Hmm. Well, okay, two things. One, I just wanted to flag that at the outset of that first question, I asked about particle astrophysics. You said that the question was sounded a bit too philosophical for you. And yeah. it in the landscape of physicists and public intellectual scientists, I think of you and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson as the the two big figures who are somewhat anti philosophy, or at least that's anti some modern philosophy. Uh, well, I, mean, I, get a, I get a rap of being anti-philosophy and I'm not, but I'm just, I just, it, it's useful in certain places and isn't useful in others. Okay. Well, I just wanted to get back to that, um, flag it and get back to it maybe a little bit later, but returning for the moment to, um, string theory and quantum gravity. And it seemed like the, the big problem for you with string theory was that it hasn't had any experimental success. So string theory is not a problem for me. Right. That's, problem yeah. for string yeah. theory. Yeah. But so in general, where do you weigh in on the state of quantum gravity research? Since I'm guessing that this is one of the areas, even though I don't think we've used that term yet, where you think there really is a crisis. Well, no, look, the problem is quantum gravity is in, 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 where the region where quantum mechanical effects impact on gravity is a region that's so far removed from anything you could directly test in the laboratory. Gravity is the weakest force in nature in the first place. It's hard to measure classical gravity at a, at a fundamental scale. Quantum gravity effects are on unbelievably small scales. The only places they're relevant, and I mean it, probably, the only places they're relevant are the final stages of collapse of a black hole and the very beginning of the universe. Other than that, quantum gravity probably is irrelevant. General relativity works fine. But I actually have worked on quantum gravity recently. I wrote a paper at Nature recently, uh, Nature Physics Reviews, with some colleagues from Europe, thinking about ways you might test quantum gravity by looking for analogs in condensed matter systems. You know, black holes have a horizon because the speed, because the escape velocity is faster than the speed of light. Well, you can create, and and that 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 results in something called Hawking radiation. Hawking first realized when you consider quantum effects, and looking at certain classical fluids or not necessarily classical semi-classical fluids or even quantum fluids in condensed matter systems people have created analogs of black holes where you can measure hawking like radiation and so i wrote a paper thinking about whether you might be able to probe other features of quantum gravity by appropriate condensed matter systems so you might analogs and of course they're always analogs so you'll be able to just get ideas of what effects may or may not be important. It's not quantum gravity directly, but it might be useful for trying to understand how to probe it. So I have thought about that a little bit, but on the whole, it's kind of a sterile enterprise because 
that's why string theories have such problems because the areas where where you're going to correct Haskell general relativity are areas that are so far removed from from anything generally we could directly detect that it makes it extremely difficult to imagine how you do how the theory would be validated or how you'd even do the right theory. Hmm. So your idea would be that rather than to generate a theory first, like string theory and then perform experiments based on it, which we don't have the energy to do, uh, it would be to go into something like a condensed matter system and try to find first uh, data and then... Well, it may not be either or. It's, it's, that's the point. It's just you look a thousand points of light. You look everywhere you can. So string theory, you know, directly, and there may be experiments you can do, but but this is another approach. So it's not either or, I think. It's mm -hmm. just you're flailing around and you look at anything you can find. You look mm -hmm. under where the lamppost is. I've used that analogy many times, right? If you're drunk mm -hmm. and you come out of a bar and you've lost your keys, where do you look? You look under the lamppost, not, not because they're there necessarily, but because the only place you'll find them is if they're, mm -hmm. yeah, if they're there. Anyway. So granted, though, that the, the quantum gravity effects are extremely small and there haven't been experiments to test the various theories, does that mean that you're pretty much agnostic on all of them, agnostic on, on string theory, loop quantum gravity, causal set theory, all of these things? Or do you have any, do you have any horse in the race? I'm generally an agnostic about everything, but, um, mm. but I do or think... Or an anti-theist, I, I heard... I well, heard I used to be. Now, I'm, uh, that's because my friend Christopher Hitchens used to say that, and I like the idea. But I'm more, now I'm much more of an apatheist. I really don't give a damn. I mean, God is irrelevant to me, so I don't even think about the question. So an apatheist is my, is my, uh, my theism. Um, but uh, uh, when it comes to different theories i mean I, I there are ones that i find more potentially more likely or at least more, more well motivated and i happen to think string theory is more well motivated than loop quantum gravity so but that you know and and i think it's also had a bigger impact on the rest of physics than loop quantum gravity has because it's developed new kinds of mathematics that doesn't mean loop quantum gravity won't someday be useful and I talked to Carlo Rovelli, and who was convinced that it, you know it is. I'm not, but um, uh, yeah. So I, you know, if, if you had, I had preferences, I'd bet. If I had to bet, I'd bet on string theory over loop quantum gravity. But I wouldn't bet a lot of money on either of them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a famous story of uh, it was about another speculation in physics that had to do with my late friend and mentor and colleague Steven Weinberg won the Nobel Prize and it's a remarkable physicist. And um I think I think it was about inflation and, and I think it was someone said, Would you would you bet um it was would you bet your life or would you bet your oldest child on you know inflation being true and and you know Alan Guth said one thing he'd bet maybe he would bet this but he wouldn't bet his old child. Andre Linde said you'd he bet his oldest child, and Stephen Weinberg said, "I would bet Andre Linde's oldest child," <laughs> which I thought was a good anyway. But mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so I wouldn't. I you know I think the point that the people don't realize is most theories are wrong. Most theories are wrong. If they weren't, anyone could do it. I mean, I've written hundreds of scientific papers, and some of them are really beautiful theories. But nature chose not to adopt them, and you know you just keep plugging away and. If every paper you came up with was right, it would just be almost boring. Okay, you've you've mentioned an, another uh, couple of things that to flag and come back to. One is Christopher Hitchens, who uh, I, I'm very curious to hear about, and then another is inflation, Andre Lindy, and and Alan Guth. But for the moment, I I actually like to stick to the string theory and ask a couple of philosophical questions, and. So one of them, I mean, I, I before we talked, I, I jotted down just some potential pro-string theory arguments, some of which are, are philosophical, because I've had a, a number of conversations on the show with people like Juan Maldacena and Andy Strominger and uh, Eric Verlinda about it. So it's it's just uh, on my let mind. Let me interject that my, my, I think my book, Hiding in the Mirror, is very optimistic. I mean, it's really 
explains why string theory is motivated. But anyway, go on. Mm -hmm. One problem that I, I don't know, it's, it's just an intuitive prejudice with quantum mechanics is that it has point particles. And I like the idea of string theory replacing them with little strings. Do you find point particles at all disturbing to admit into the furniture of the universe? No, because they're not really. But I mean, because it's it, they're not really. <laughs> yes and no. Look, I mean, when you get to infinitesimal things, obviously something is going to cut that off. Things aren't infinitesimally small. They're not infinitely small. There's going to be some effects that are going to cut off that that singularity. I don't think. I I, I think. As string theorists have learned, strings are not the fundamental objects in string theory anymore. It's brains, and so yeah. I don't even know what the fundamental objects are. But I don't, I don't find, I don't find little strings any less or any more physically plausible than fundamental point particles. Because really, what string theory does, it's a, it's a lot of fancy mathematics and and um, and to be fair much of which i i don't even comprehend um but the fundamental idea the reason it works is it it, it just gives you a cutoff instead of being instead of going being i mean infinitely small string theory has this thing called duality so there's a smaller size and uh, and it's a there's a duality so when you go to smaller scales it's equivalent to something at larger scales so it's it's just like saying well i i i i there is a smallest size be below which things don't exist. And if I said that, I could say that for point particles and, and it would be just, and they'd be just as finite. The, 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 the conclusions that came about would be just as finite as they are in string theory. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify something you said about strings, not being the, Sort of fundamental fundamental particles in, in string theory or M theory is it yeah. the case that they're not fundamental or just that there are multiple fundamental? Things? Well, yeah. I mean, look. It, well, it, yeah. Okay, there are multiple fundamentals. One, one. The reason it's called M theory is you don't even know what the theory is a theory of. Mm -hmm. And my former colleague and friend Joe Polchinski, before he died, was one of the people who. <clears throat> first recognize that brains that, that, that something called brains are probably fundamental to understanding the mathematics of string theory and these brain like objects are I think what what now are our, our greatest interest but but what are the ultimate variables of the theory and, and what it describes I, I think I, I, look I may some people may correct me here but I, I think it, at this point it, no one knows it's it's a crapshoot, and it's it's full of fascinating ideas and objects and mathematics, and 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 the practitioners are fascinated by it, and also they're true believers, which sort of have to be if you're working for thirty years. The good thing is those of them who are scientists, and not all of them are, and by that I mean not scientists in the true spirit of science. Those of them that are scientists would be willing to drop it, like yesterday's newspaper, if it actually made a prediction that was wrong. So they're science, but most of them who are doing it are scientists in that true sense. They they're true believers. They work on it. They're convinced it's right. But happily, if it were proved to be wrong, they'd throw it out. So I I give them the benefit of the doubt. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm not a string theorist, so I will also probably be uh, open to correction here. But my understanding is that the, in M theory there is this web of dualities where uh, one uh, fundamental or there's a smallest length in, in of one string in one theory and it can be sort of translated into a, a larger string in another yeah, string you, theory. Yeah, there's a scale below which you can't go because everything smaller right. than it is equivalent to larger. So effectively it means like the physics has a small scale. The string associated with the string tension. Mm -hmm. the, and, the but what line. I was going to say is that in th this leads to space not really being continuous there is the smallest scale and you said that's kind of why it works for quantizing gravity in in some respects but that's not the case for quantum field theory where space is continuous and that's why we have these point particles and i'm wondering if 
the continuity of space as opposed to this discreteness of being space is is problematic for you at all well it is that uh, and but quantum field theory isn't a theory of gravity it's not a theory of space it's a theory of fields within space but if you put a cutoff if you say there's a small scale then quantum field theory works very well and doesn't produce infinities um but that's that you have to impose that right it's arbitrary and and um and but you know that's the problem quantum field theory but it's okay. We understand the world in terms of effective theories now. There is no fundamental theory. Some think theorists may think they have it, but up to that point, there's no fundamental theory that's true. None of the theories we have now are absolutely true. They're all effective theories. And that so and and we all expect that at some high scale of energy and small scale of distance that those theories will be modified. The problems with quantum field theory, and they're no problems, but the the, the where it looks like they're problems, the infinities arise from extrapolating the theory to a domain where you know it's not true. But the great thing is the theories that make sense have results that are independent of the nonsense at that, 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 that scale that we know things are wrong. That's called renormalizability. You, you can, throw, you can li- effectively get rid of those infinities in a way that they don't affect any of the predictions of the theory at, at low energy scales. It's, and it was a mystery to... to to Feynman, who used it to you know, develop a way to understand normalizability and get a sensible theory of of quantum electronics, and he thought it was like some magic box. And I, I, I assume at the end of his life he knew. I, I talked to him near them, but I, I but certainly this, it, you know, of course, he knew. But in when he got the Nobel Prize, he talked about this is just some magic prescription that has no. We don't understand it, but we do understand it now. We understand it was Ken Wilson and others who helped us understand what we now call effective theories, and that the whole world is an effective theory. There's no none of the theories we have are fundamental. That doesn't bother us. Mm-hmm. Well, the 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 last uh, sort of philosophical question in this this area that I'll ask you is, I mean, in our in our macroscopic picture of the world, we see it as kind of populated by objects, definite objects. We don't have this idea of invisible forces, invisible fields. And my understanding is that in quantum field theory, the fields are sort of the fundamental objects and what we measure as particles are just perturbations in the field. Whereas cases of the fields, yeah. The fields yeah. are fundamental. They're quantum fields. And what that tells you is, is the field gives you the probability of creating a particle Mm-hmm. Uh, in a given place, and, mm-hmm. and that's and so that that's the fundamental fe- the fundamental variable is the probability of creating or destroying particles here or there, and that's what quantum fields are. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what I was going I was going to contrast this with string or M theory, where uh, vibrations of of brains or strings kind of those are what's fundamental, and then the fields are just emergent. Their well, effective descriptions I don't know whether they're emerg- any more emergent. They're, the ex- they're, particles are excitations of quantum fields, fundamental quantum excitations of quantum fields. String theory, the strings are quantized and their and their modes are quantized, and particles are excitations are of those you know are, are quantized modes of a string. So I don't really see anything fundamentally different from that a quantized mode of a of a field, but. But I mean, in in spirit, it's exactly the same thing to me. I guess okay. maybe a limitation of my thinking, but I don't really see any any um, any real difference. Um, uh, except, well, the real difference is that it's an excitation of an object, right? One, right. But it's a mathematical object. And the strings may not even exist. They may be, ma- you know, we often create mathematical crutches, and many times people thought. Uh, Faraday thought his fields, and he invented the idea of fields, even though he was an experimentalist. He thought they were a crutch that allowed him to, because he couldn't do the mathematics, the algebra, without it. And then, you know, Delman invented quarks, but he also thought they were hypothetical, just mathematical tools that helped you understand some basic premise of of strongly interacting particles. But they turned out to be real. Um, And strings... If they if that theory does apply to nature, may be real, or they could just be they could just be mathematical constructs that help you um, understand the mathematics of what's going on. 
anyway, but the bottom line is you're right. There's one, the str strings are objects, and when they're excited, they create different particles. Fields are not objects it, per se. They're, they're mathematical constructs, but we also think they correspond to things in reality. I guess it's, again, it's full of, it's, it's semantics. And mm -hmm. I don't like to get embroiled in semantics if I can help it. One of the problems of, cosmo of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Well, there are two last things in in hiding in the mirror that I wanted to talk about. So, hiding in the mirror is not about string theory per se. It's about alternate multiple dimensions. It's about the this fascinations that humans have had with the idea that there's more out there than meets the eye, and in, in in a true sense that there are extra dimensions. And I love the reason I wrote the book was to was to, um, well, part like uh, many books, I, I, it just teach myself something, and I wanted to learn about the history of that idea in art and literature, and mm -hmm. and so I followed it back to the eighteen, you know, nineteenth century, and um, and it was fun to learn about its impact in literature and 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 art and and, and the and the art uh, movements of the early twentieth century. Yeah. Um, Speaking of literature, this is. Uh unrelated but i know that you introduced you interviewed cormac mccarthy which is just absolutely amazing <laughs> yeah i know cormac was a friend and i and he never did interviews he he trusted me a little bit but he had that course near the end he wasn't well he was never talking to me he was always he was always like getting blood from a stone but and i knew it would be but at least he agreed and i, I wanted to do it while he was still alive and he agreed and that was a great show of trust yeah, no, it's great hard that day, and 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 really didn't want to talk much. I know people think I talk too much, but you don't understand what it was like to be on the couch with Cormac when he was tired and all. But it was a great gift, and it was a great gift to know him, and it was a great gift to have him edit one of my books. Oh, really? And, wow. Yeah, he edited. Yeah, yeah, he actually um, edited two, but he officially edited my book Quantum Man, which is a scientific biography of. Of Richard Feynman, and he liked the hardcover so much that he wrote me and said, "I can make the paperback perfect if you let me edit it." And I said, "Of course." And he said, that, uh, "One rule, though, or two rules: you got to get rid of all exclamation marks and all semicolons. There's really? no room in English literature for either." So I said, "Fine." And he 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 edited it, and and then if you look at the paperback of Quantum Man, you'll see it says with with edited by Cormac McCarthy. Huh. So. I well, I can understand the semicolons, but I hadn't. I I knew that he's very kind of anti excessive punctuation. But do you have any insight into why he didn't like the exclamation points? No, I don't think I ever asked him. I just said whatever you want to do, Cormac is fine with me. Yeah. Uh, that's funny. I I <laughs> he's on my mind because I was just talking about Blood Meridian this morning yeah no actually. i mean it's uh i'm very lucky to have known a lot of interesting people and had them as friends and i'm always kind of surprised when they they want to be my friends but cormac <laughs> was uh we we go back and and he, he agreed to do things that i don't think he would have done other uh, otherwise we hadn't been so kind of generous as a friend and mm -hmm. he and he changed my thinking about the world in numerous ways i've already talked about it many times that um that when I I first met him, uh, he was very chipper. He was in a lunchroom of a, a institute in Santa Fe, and um, and I kind of couldn't connect that kind of jovial, happy fellow with the guy who wrote No Country for Old Men and The Road. And I said, "How can you be so chipper?" You know, and, so, and he said, "Well, I'm a pessimist, but that's no reason to be gloomy." <laughs> and that's become my mantra in life. I think so. No, that that's good. I have I've read the road, which is wonderful. But I I haven't it's read, read No Country for Old Men, but it's a terrific movie. <laughs> well, the be book is better than the movie. I read the book before I, I saw the movie, and, and the movie is pretty good. It's a pretty faithful rendition. It, but as always, the book is generally better, mm -hmm. and uh, it's. Um, it certainly doesn't present a, a, a hopeful view of humanity. <laughs> yeah. But speaking of these, I mean, wonderful friends, you've mentioned a number of uh, phenomenal physicists already. And then there's Christopher Hitchens. And I saw that. And speaking of them helping you with your writing in various ways, I 
saw that Chris Christopher Hitchens was was going to write was it an afterword for Universe from Nothing? But then no, he was writing the foreword. Richard forward. Dawkins wrote the afterword, and he yeah. and Christopher had finished half of it, and he told me about it, and it was great. And I was very sorry that it couldn't be. Used I, when... I occasionally think about how terrific. Uh, he would have been as a, a podcast guest or as a podcaster yeah, oh yeah. himself. Yeah, yeah. He would have been. Yeah, he, well, he was, yeah, he, no one could compete with him. He would have been, he is, he was a terrific speaker. And yeah, and 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 now you've made me wistful because it would have been amazing to have the forward from, from Christopher and the afterward from Richard. And his forward is really good. I tried to indicate later on in my lectures, I've talked about some of the ideas that he presented in his forward. And I've used them in my lectures and, and of course, give it him credit. Hmm. Um, anyway, it's fun to talk to him about science. I and mean, he was yeah. wonder. Well, the the last thing I'll, I'll say on this note before we get back to our, our main thread is I also saw that you, you've, you've interviewed Douglas Murray. And when I think of Christopher Hitchens, Douglas Murray now comes to mind. I, because yeah. I recently saw a debate that he did with Malcolm Gladwell and I have just never seen somebody perform so like powerfully in a debate before that it, it was whispers of him. Yeah. D- Douglas, I've said it. I, I think I said it in that podcast, or at least my introduction to the podcast. He reminds me a lot of Christopher. Hmm. Some people hate him because he's, yeah. he's, but, but I think he's very similar in my, his, his love of literature, his willingness to explore as a journalist, war zones, but his, but he, he, he can be devastating in debate, I haven't watched him debate Malcolm Gladwell. I assume he he eviscerated him. It was um, it was so horrendous that Malcolm Gladwell went to like a a debate school and did a whole episode on his own podcast about how terribly he did in the debate. Well, good, good. I mean, you know, Gladwell's a ch- a charming speaker, but yeah, mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to be on the other side. So- uh, it's I wouldn't want to be in the other side of a debate against Doug Murray. Happily. I wasn't, although, you know, we disagree fundamentally about a number of things. I don't think we talked about climate change, for example, where he's definitely wrong. But He's but, anti-climate change? I well, think I think he's more, uh, yeah, I think he is um, more skeptical um, than he should be. Um, or less understanding of the fundamental things that are accurate about, about climate science. Right. I, I, we've both spoken with uh, Tim Palmer who I think makes a yeah. very yeah, yeah. persuasive case about. Oh yeah. Yeah. Tim, that was, yeah. He's, he's written a good book and that's why he wrote, talked to him like it. And, mm-hmm. um, and I, and, and, and I don't always view, but well, you know, I don't want to put words in, in, in Douglas's, I, I, you know, there, he, it wouldn't surprise me if he was also, he's not anti-vax because he's not ridiculous, but he, it, we probably have different views about, about the need for vaccination. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. You know, I know. Uh, 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 anyway, no, but I, I don't I, agree everything. But then I didn't agree with Christopher on the invasion of Iraq. So there you go. Yeah. Well, now this is really the last thing I'll say. I, I very sure, much appreciate that. that. But then it goes on. Yeah. yeah go on. The on your show, you interview people that you don't agree with on everything, mm-hmm. and you treat them well because that's not really the case on every podcast. Yeah. No. A lot of the Merco chambers. I, look, I learned that from Christopher. Uh, Christopher was the most generous person I knew in terms of, you know, people think he's a bulldog, but he was the most generous person I knew being able to talk to and enjoy people with whom he was diametrically opposed on on, on ideology or philosophy. And um, it's a wonderful thing. So I think I, 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 I tried to um, <laughs> emulate that in some sense because I don't think, yeah, it's important. That, that's the whole point is to, Talk to people you disagree with. Otherwise, that's the whole point of free speech, mm-hmm. and the whole point of, of of conversations. So, yeah, I do talk to a lot of people I agree with, but I really like it when I have a conversation with someone. And of course, I get just the most vitriolic hate when Douglas is on. Was on. I mean, if you read the the comments from some people, it's just it's just amazing how much they hate that guy. And you know, and and it works in the other direction as well. So. Yeah, yeah, I I did a a few episodes recently on Israel and Palestine, talking to people from different perspectives. So, if I have a left leaning person, 
Uh, some people hate him. Some people love him. If I have a right leaning person, it's the same thing. Uh, yeah, 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 but, yeah. So you just got to hope, you know, it's nice to have something where the, the and the point is that the, the noisemakers are always in the minority that most people want to actually hear, hear different perspectives. And then more, more importantly, that's, those are the people you're really appealing to. The other people you're never going to change their minds or even have them listen but the vast majority of people in the, in the, um, in the, are, are people who, who are willing to hear something new and think about it. I like to think, otherwise I don't know the purpose, why I'm, I do many of the things I do. Hmm. Well, okay. Now returning to those last two points I wanted to ask about regarding hiding in the mirror, but this isn't quite cosmology or maybe it is depending on the, attitude you take and it is certainly not about more dimensions it's about less dimensions but with juan maldesina in particular we talked about the ads cft correspondence so anti-dissider space conformal and frank that's what his key insight was as a graduate student theory Mm -hmm. yeah and the holographic principle and the holographic principle on which ads cft is based didn't arise out of string theory it arrived i mean gerard at hoft first formulated it and it had to do with black holes uh, black hole entropy and and hawking radiation Mm -hmm. but i'm wondering whether or not you put any credence in it as a model of the universe in which there is sort of a two-dimensional boundary or three-dimensional depending on how you look at it in which our universe is just sort of a, as we know it, the bulk is just a projection of that. Well, I think. Uh, by the I way, there's the that clicking. I think there's the interesting thing about it is that, is that this whole holographic principle and ASCFT suggests that the notion of dimensions might be illusory, that it's really not. Well, it's like waves and particles. I mean, it's a nice description, but it, but but it it may not have an absolute reality in the sense that um, um, what you mean by dimension, uh, one observer could think they live in a universe that's that has a different number of dimensions than the other observer does, in because you can complete this. Thinks that it's true, you can completely describe nature in a different set of variables. Whether it's just a mathematical trick. Or whether it has a more profound physical reality is something again I don't know. But it, but but if the mathematics were really true, and let's face it, it's not it's not true in any system that we know of that we're living. I mean, it's true in extreme idealizations. But if it were true, then it really would mean that from a point of view of a physicist. The dimension is not is not a is not an absolute quantity any more than time or space is. One person's time is another person's space. In in relativity, one person's time interval is another person's space interval. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're just for you the jury's out, and at least at the moment, it's an interesting mathematical device. Oh, it's fascinating mathematics. I think it's one of the more interesting things that's come out of string theory, and t- at least in terms of, and of course, it just is the father of many great ideas in physics. Um, it's a fascinating idea. It's a lot of a lot of useful work in because you can you know you sometimes think you have a physical system one way it makes it very hard to calculate. If you think of it the other way, it makes it very easy, well, easier to calculate. And it's been a very, very useful tool in that sense, taking systems that for which you, you can't calculate predictions, but but mapping them into their into their dual partners, it allows you to use well known techniques to do calculations. So it's been very useful in a variety of areas of physics. Hmm. This is, I mean, it goes back to something you said earlier, but it reminds me of Andy Strominger's position where he's just totally agnostic, or maybe he's an apatheist, uh, but about whether or not strings exist. He doesn't think we will ever discover them, and he views his work 
in a purely sort of instrumental way. He, he thinks that all of these are just great tools for solving problems, like with the black hole entropy problem that he solved. That's interesting that Andy um, thinks that. Um, it's, a, it's a reasonable approach. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, he's been interested in, 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 in quantum gravity since he was a student, since I was a student, I, we were both students together. I know him well, so. Mm -hmm. But I guess this is a place where I, I see room for philosophers of physics because Eric Verlinda, for instance, he doesn't believe this came out of our conversation that singularities exist at the center of black holes. He doesn't, he said he doesn't think about it at all. All he, all that's real to him is the surface, because that's where all the information is contained. Well, fine. Who the hell cares? What, I mean, don't, no offense to Eric, but who the hell cares what he thinks? The nature is the way it is, and and we shouldn't use the word believe. And and it's true that we can't access any that that it's a mystery and it's useless to talk about singularities because we don't have the physics to understand that. And and so you work with the system that you can understand and and it's fine for him to say that all that matters is the surface that may provide all the information you need about the formation and evolution of black holes, but things really presumably do fall inside black holes and it might be of interest to find out what happens to them. Yes. Unless, unless they don't fall into black holes and something's just happening on the surface. Well, yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't even, maybe, I don't, maybe Eric believes that. I, I think that'd be hard to, Hard to, well, I mean, if you take I mean, the... I, we, we look, we came up with an argument. I have a paper with a colleague of mine, Tom about this body, a few others, years ago, which which still gets some interest. Um, it the question whether black holes even exist. Hmm. It could be that 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 uh, that um, basically things that look that appear from the outside like black holes form, but that but you never actually get to a. Uh, an event horizon or a singularity that the system evaporates quantum mechanically before any of those any of those surfaces or singularities form. Could you we, we showed it with a calculation? If that's true, then then there is no paradox, and they're just it, when from the outside it looks like a system. It looks like a black hole, but it's not really a black hole. And that to me is a very satisfactory solution. I don't know if it's right. Uh, I bet it isn't, but but it's still interesting. Could you walk me through how that this account would look when a star collapses? Like what what would, what would be happening? Well, when a star collapses, you know stuff. So stuff is collapsing, right? Yeah, and it's getting denser and denser and denser. But quantum mechanical effects are relevant as it gets denser and denser and denser, and the system can their excitation it can radiate radiate away energy. And the question is, does it radiate away its energy before the system collapses to be within its, its own event horizon or not? And um, and if it does, if it keeps radiating energy at a sufficiently high rate, then the event horizon never catches up to the surface that's collapsing, and the whole system evaporates before any event horizon has been formed. It sounds like a scam, but it can it can work. So, what would account for the fact that we don't observe radiation coming out of black? Well, because these effects happen on because time scales associated with them. You know, if if you're if you're talking about um, effects as seen from an observer at infinity, very short time scales on the on the a scale of a of a of a of a black hole event horizon translate into very long times for an outside observer. So just like you know, in a regular black hole, you don't see something fall in. You see it slow down right. and freeze at the surface. And so the question is, is or what you're seeing is a very dense thing, which may not even exist anymore. I see. Okay, that's very cool. <laughs> I hadn't heard that. And, and, and the word point is, it may be cool, but there were calculations to support that picture using mm. collapse of spherical shells. I doubt it's right, but it is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Okay, well, last thing There's about... one way to resolve a paradox that I still don't think has been resolved about black hole and it's black holes in inspiration. Okay. Anyway. Well, the, the, the last thing about hitting in the mirror and extra 
dimensions, just restricting us to the extra dimensions for the moment. Are you at this point all in on, on a four dimensional space time or are your fingers crossed for 26 dimensional universe or I'm not all in on anything that I haven't okay. been able to measure or, 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 uh, or test. So I, you know, I, I, I see no evidence for extra dimensions beyond four at this point. And I, 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 I tend to side with Feynman who said that they don't, string theory doesn't explain anything. It just it makes excuses. But, uh, so the big thing that string theory never does is explain why, if there are many dimensions, why we live in a universe that appears to be four dimensional. Well, it sort of does. It's, it does by the anthropic argument that many different, you know, universes of different dimensionality could exist, and 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 maybe we live in one that's four dimensional because it, you know, we can. Um, and that argument works, but it doesn't explain anything. It 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 it, it, it again, it makes excuses. It's plausible, perhaps. So yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm suspicious of extra dimensions. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm skeptical. Hmm. But but um, you know they, but I wouldn't I wouldn't be um, shocked if they exist. But I, I if I if you ask me to bet, I'd bet against them. Hmm. Okay, well, I guess maybe closing the chapter on extra dimensions returning to something you said much I mean, earlier I, I love extra and i wrote a book about it because i'm fast i mean i think it's fascinating particularly large extra dimensions and i'm very happy i don't know if i put it in the book i probably did um you know i've had students um my, uh, mine who played a key role in making extra dimensions much more uh, fashionable making extra dimensions large you know, in string theory, the original idea was the extra dimensions were curled up on a scale so small you can never measure them. But it was realized by a bunch of people, including one of my graduates, in Robin Sundrum, um, along with Lisa, at the time he's working with Lisa Randall, mm -hmm. um, that uh, that it's possible they could be large, and and that's fascinating. Although I'm pretty sure it's wrong. Well, all the tests have shown it isn't. The original motivation for it appears to be gone, and it was extremely ugly, but as I point out, it got him tenure, and I'm very happy for that reason. No, that's, no, that's great. Um, especially if uh, physics is as difficult to get tenure in as philosophy is. Well, it, it depends. Yeah, well, I, let's not go into that. But, I mean, it's not, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it depends who you are. Mm -hmm. But, oh, okay. Cool. Returning to Christopher Hitchens, and you said that he gave you the name anti-theist, but you have since become, you said, an apatheist? I yeah, I mean, he, he, we, you know, he said, look, it, he doesn't, not only doesn't accept that there's a God, but he wouldn't want to live in a universe with a God, particularly the God of any of the Abrahamic religions. He, and I agree, I wouldn't want to live in such a universe. What an awful creature, what an awful being <laughs> who would want to ever live in a universe controlled by such a prick. But, 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 and that's true, but m for me, much more importantly, I'm an apatheist because people somehow think that God is important in science, that the issue of God and science and creation comes up all the time. And I've been a scientist for f over 40 years, and I never heard the word come up in any scientific meeting. God just doesn't matter when it comes to science. God is irrelevant. And so, we, you know, why talk about God? I mean, we could talk about unicorns. They're just as relevant. Mm -hmm. so i i read god is not great when i was in high school and it sparked Lucky. a militant anti-theist phase for me that lasted about a year or two oh i uh, okay I'm, i well and it was it's what it's the best book on the subject in my opinion yeah they were. yeah 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 he's terrific but so i i know that you have spent a lot of time um debating theologians and talking publicly with uh, Richard Dawkins, for instance, on, on the topic. But now that you're an apatheist, is that stage of your life over? I never like to think in those terms. I, I don't, I stopped, I, I stopped debating theologians a while ago because I just found it tiresome. And I think I said everything I needed to say. Um, so I keep, I get requests all the time. Um, and so I, I'm happy to have a conversation with someone whose views are different than mine in that regard, but not that that's the central being of their existence. Um, 
And uh, so um, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, under the right circumstances, I, I don't like debate. I also just don't like debates anymore. I, I, I just prefer to have dialogues and debates. I don't like the format of a debate. I think it's not it's not designed to inform it's 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 all based on on uh performance and um um rhetoric that's the word i was looking for and 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 so i'd rather just have a dialogue and and uh and find areas where you agree and disagree but but it, not not to have not to make a statement to have these a di- diametrically opposed statements that one person has to defend and the other person has to criticize. It's, mm. it's, it's a form of entertainment, but it's not pretty useful. Hmm. Well, one thing that I wanted to ask about regarding uh, theism and anti-theism relates to a conversation I had on the show with um, Sean Carroll and then a, a philosopher that I know you've well, Sean Carroll's a philosopher, isn't he? Okay, yes. sorry, go on. Another philosopher that I know you've had a, some back and forth with, um, David Albert. But we we talked about fine-tuning. And Sean said that he thought that the argument for fine-tuning is the best argument for the existence of God, but it's also just a terrible argument. And for our listeners who aren't really familiar with it, I'm, well, I'm wondering... I'm surprised you said that, but then... Wow, that's a stupid thing to say. <laughs> oh, why? Because you think it's a good argument for the existence of God? Oh, I thought he said it. Did you say? Did you say he said it was the best argument? He said it was the best it? argument, but it's still a bad argument. I don't think it's a good. Ar- I don't even think it's the best argument. Okay, well, for our listeners who aren't familiar with it, um, could you say how, how or say how you think the argument goes and why it's the, not uh, even a good uh, argument? The argument goes, and it's an incorrect argument. First of all, so that's the, the whole point. It's no argument in, in any case. There's no such thing as fine tuning. The universe isn't fine tuned. No matter, it, it looks, it may look like it's fine tuned, but it's not fine tuned. But the argument is that certain characteristics, like the cosmological constant, like the energy of space, that if they were any different, life like we, like us, would not have arisen. And moreover, that value of that energy is so absurdly inexplicable that it appears that it has to be fine-tuned, that any any other value is more sensible than the one it has. Now, the problem with that argument is twofold, threefold, well, n-fold, um, that, first of all, it, it presumes... It, it presumes that there isn't a natural explanation of why... Of why the, the energy of empty space has the value it does. And historically, that's generally been the case when things have been used, when the anthropic argument has been used to understand something, it's really lately, uh, ultimately been shown to be supplanted by a fundamental explanation of why why things are the way they are, first. But secondly, so they're fine. If they were different... Then we we might be different, and and having a discussion about why that the different value is so special. Uh, you know, it assumes that all life is all, all, the only life that can exist is life like you and me, and uh, no other life forms that could exist under different, very different circumstances, and that's just such a myopic view. Um, that I, you know, so it's it's based on this that presumption, and and moreover, moreover, the people who usually say it don't understand that, for example, that well, the well, while you can use the the existence of life as an as a as an explanation for why the energy of empty space is what it is, assuming there are an infinite number of universes and re- and universes you know, are formed and they have a random value of that energy of empty space. Well, you can show, you can predict by the fact that we're here that the energy of empty space should not be larger than X. And and it should be of the order of magnitude, if it's not zero, that that we observe it to have it. And that was Steven Weinberg's argument. But in fact, if you actually looked at it, 
the if the energy of empty space were precisely zero, which is what we all thought before some of us proposed it wasn't, then it then it'd be better for life. Life would live longer in, in, in our universe. So the universe would have more life in it than it has if if it has other forms of life. So it's not as if the value we have is the best value for life to exist. Be, if it was zero, it would be much better. So, I, you know, every argument about fine-tuning seems to me to have huge holes in it and, and huge assumptions, most of which are generally wrong. And, and uh, you know... The and I'm partly to blame in the sense that when the you know, I because I proposed the cosmological concept before it was observed, and I and I argue, I pointed out how ridiculous it was, how how ridiculous the value was. And I, you know, I, I remember saying it's unbelievably, you know, fine tuned in that sense that what, what, you know, what, why would it have that value? It was mostly just to be provocative, but. But I don't think there's any fundamental um, philosophical argument that you can that makes sense based on the fact that the cosmological constant has a value that no one can understand. Hmm. I mean, every one it is is just specious or or superficial. And and hmm. and the, and I even wrote scientific papers on this. If you assume that life. Is it like our forms of life? You can make a same argument for why the Weinberg's argument for why the cosmological constant should have the value it roughly has falls apart if you make uh, other assumptions about the nature of life. You can predict the cosmological constant a vastly different number. So anyway, the fine tuning argument. It, it's such a bad argument for God because. It, it, it looks like you're saying God had to fine tune this number to one part in 120 so that his beautiful creation could exist. Now, my point is God could have made it zero, which is the sensible value, and we could exist and everything would be better. So God's a pretty crummy arch architect. If, if He chose this ridiculous value mm -hmm. when, it, when zero would have made everyone happier and we would all be living longer and, and there'd be a lot more life in the universe. So the argument that that, that that ridiculous value points to an intelligent designer is ridiculous. It points to a pretty unintelligent designer, like yeah. most arguments by intelligent design. Mm -hmm. So, I uh, I mean, this also connects to Alan Guth and Andre Lindy, who you mentioned, and inflation, and also to to string theory. And one of the, I think arguments for string theory that I didn't mention yet is it purports in some fashion to account for fine tuning because it arise our, our physics arises out of a fundamental theory whereas the standard particle model I mean has these 17 or so free parameters that have to be settled by experiment but <laughs> by your expression I can tell that well, you... that's the but that's the biggest failure of string theory perhaps of all the failures of string theory and there are many is that think theory hasn't explained the one thing, the one thing that you think a quantum theory of gravity would explain, which is why the energy of empty space is what it is. It's given us no insight into that whatsoever. Generally, string theories predict a value which is vastly different than what we see. It's been the biggest failure of string theory. So uh, to argue that somehow it counts for fine-tuning is the exact opposite. String theory has nothing to say about it except to potentially give a... Uh, playing field, which allows the anthropic principle. Because string theory ostensibly has many possible vacua, we don't know for sure, but appears to have many possible ground states, potentially, you know, huge, infinite almost, but maybe not infinite, but almost. It, it gives you the platform for saying, well, all sorts of different universes could exist, and the only ones that we'd be living in would look like the ones we live in. So, yeah, to that's, but that we don't need string theory for that, but it gives you, I mean, the the multiverse of inflation is much more well motivated than the multiverse of string theory. Mm. So just to make sure that I'm not making a mistake here, there are plenty of string theorists who do think that string theory accounts for um, the fine tuning problem. This isn't just something that I'm manufacturing. Right? What, what, you mean for the value of the energy of empty space being so small? 
No, for the for the fact that there are like ten to the five hundred ground states of the string, and each one might correspond to a different universe in this multiverse, and yeah, one yeah. would thus be ours. Yeah, well, that's not string theory. That's the anthropic principle. That's saying that yeah, we can't predict anything, but if anything's possible, then it's not surprising that we exist. Yeah, if that's an explanation. But that comes that's... out of string theory, yeah, at least, well, or it's it, related to string it, theory in this sense. The anthropic playing field. The string landscape gives a, a a fundament. It does give a motivation for the anthropic principle, but it's not the only one, and I think it's not the best motivated one. Mm -hmm. And you, it, do you think the best motivated one is the inflationary one that you were absolutely, just... absolutely, okay. because inflation relies on physics we understand, and it's almost inevitable. It's almost inevitable that our universe is part of an, uh, an inflating multiverse. It's hard to get away from it. So this is something that you uh, agree with. We found something that's contentious that you agree with, and, and we can't directly test I don't whether know if it's or not. Contentious, they're... but I think it, if you know, if you if you think about inflation, it's hard to imagine an inflationary model that doesn't that isn't eternal, in the and 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 that does therefore uh, uh, produce a multiverse. Now that doesn't always imply that the laws of physics are different in every in every pocket universe, as, as, as Alan Guth would call it, uh, but it allows that possibility. Hmm. I think it's definitely contentious, maybe uh, uh, not in the cosmological circles, but that we live in a multiverse of this sort. Where's the contentious? I think most physicists think it's the most likely possibility. Most physicists okay. who thought about it, I think most physicists, who, most theoretical physicists who thought about it and know anything about inflation think that's probably the most likely possibility hmm. and so one of the problems that you identified well, that's bad. we may all be wrong but i think it's it's it, i think you'd find a con more consensus than you might think one of the problems that you identified with string theory is that there aren't uh currently technologically feasible experimental methods to directly test or observe strings but by that same token we can't directly observe these other multiverses so what is the is it theoretical or experimental data that leads you to believe though you could be wrong in their existence i look i have proposed a way to to, to find out if the multi other well in in other inflationary multiverses exist hmm. how's um, that and and uh it will it will it will it, it will indirectly Give strong evidence they exist, just like Einstein's pr prediction of the of Brownian motion gave great indirect evidence that atoms exist. Couldn't see them directly, but but it, everything about the, the the observations was consistent and strongly, compellingly suggest atoms were real and not a mathematical IC, which in 1905 was a big issue. A lot of chemists thought math atoms were also just a mathematical artifice. Um, anyway, so the idea is that, is that if, um, if we observed gravitational waves from inflation, then two things, by the way, as I've shown with my, with, with Frank Wilczek, in fact, but as we showed, it tells us that gravity is a quantum theory. There will be no gravitational waves from inflation if gravity isn't a quantum theory. You know, and it's up for grabs. I mean, other, many people like Atuf probably think that Gravity isn't a quantum theory. That quantum mechanics is going to go out the window before general relativity. Um, so that would be fascinating. It would show that gravity is a quantum theory. But you see, if you could find those gravitational waves, then you could actually know, you could actually measure parameters of inflation, if you wish. And, and, and then you'd have a model. And in those parameters, you'd say, is this an inflationary model that results in a multiverse? And if you've tested that, I mean, this is an ideal situation. But if you do that, then you say, okay, well, that's the model we've tested, and that's what that's what happened. And therefore, there must, even though we can't see it, there must be a multiverse. Hmm. This, so it's uh, indirect evidence, just, just like the indirect evidence of, of atoms, in my opinion. Yeah, this reminds me of uh, getting back to where we started, Brian Keating's yeah. work trying to detect gravitational waves through yeah of course he saw, we predicted them and he was they were trying to detect them and 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 looked like they had but they but they hadn't mm -hmm. well looked like they had but it's not clear that they it 
they couldn't we couldn't say they detected it you can't there say they did dust it was the no, the noise is big enough that you couldn't yeah. tell it was a signal mm-hmm. i wanted to end with something that i'm particularly curious about you haven't spoken to sam harris on the show have you not on my podcast no not on your podcast okay well and i don't i i think i was on his podcast he said so many podcasts i don't know which one i was on yeah but uh I am not sure which uh, book it was in. Uh, no, I, and I think I think it was from in a universe from nothing. But uh-huh. you wrote that just as religion hasn't helped us understand the way the world is with regard to science, uh, as you just echoed a few minutes ago. I think you uh, prophesized. Maybe that's not the right word. That it will also be shown that religion wasn't at all helpful with regard to morality and that science might help us better in this respect. And I imagine that the religion not helping us with morality, we can just point to God is not great to give us some, some great examples Mm -hmm. of that. But where do you think that we ought to, derive our, our moral knowledge or our moral principles from well if not you something use the like right word ought i do think it's i do agree with Hume that you can't get ought from is but but um uh but i do think that science and maybe empirical evidence and logic and and and, and strict logic and reason applied to empirical evidence is the only way one can one can get a, a reasonable morality and it does not everything but without knowing what the implications of your actions are you can't decide what actions are 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 good now the science tell you always which actions are good no but it can tell you but it can tell you what the implications of your actions are and a reasonable person using reason could decide that actions are bad based on that so i think morality without science is impossible Okay, and this might be too philosophical for you. That's okay. But then, does our notion of what good is is that supposed to come from science as well, or your? Well, you know, again, that I mean, not unambiguously, but you can make rational arguments, and utilitarian philosophers like my friend Peter Singer would 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 argue that you can look at the implications of actions, and one of the things you might say is that the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Or you can make a lot of arguments which are rational. And I don't know if you can, I, I, I don't think you can ever decide between them on the basis of, of the science alone, but you can at least, you can at least produce, you can at least produce alternatives that rational people can debate. Uh, but I mean, just taking like a simple example, uh, like it would be bad if I just hit my dog who's who's sitting right behind me is the reason that science would tell us this is bad is that if we hooked up a brain monitor to him or something it would cause pain and we've just decided that pain is bad that's one reason there's a lot of arguments you can think of you can show that it would cause pain but is pain bad you know if you're if you're a masochist maybe it isn't um uh so you could argue that maybe pain isn't so bad but you could also argue if you're a dog, then dogs will become violent, and that'll be, that'll that they'll they won't be good pets, and they won't be they'll be dangerous, and therefore, you know, you can make all sorts of arguments for for what what why it would lead to a society that's not as stable or happy. Um, but at, at some level, it always comes down to things that I think are are um, um, are debatable, but reasonable people can debate and try and lead to. Uh, uh, and 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 try and use reason to convince oneself. So I think you can't get off from this, but you can get damn close. You can lead in the right direction. Hmm. Okay, well, I think that's a really good uh, note to end. So again, Lawrence, thank you so much for your time. It's been really fun. Thank you.